Uh, yeah. Yeah, please, I'll start. Is it three o'clock? Perhaps it is. Oh, yes, it is three o'clock. All right, great. Uh, so uh, thank you, everyone. And thanks again, Paul, for, for hosting. I'm, uh, I'm convening today. Uh, and I'm very excited uh, to have Andy Wickert and Shanti uh, Penpreis here uh, to discuss um, waves of ice sheet mediated uh, aggradation and incision uh, and how it transforms upper Mississippi Valley networks. But before we uh, get started, um, let me go to my next slide. Um, so uh, as you probably all know, some of you have, have, uh, have, have joined talks before, but you can find a list of these talks if you follow this, uh, this Earl here. Um, this probably gets you to a, a YouTube link or Zoom link actually, and, and you can follow on, on Billy Billy as well. And there's, of course, all of these are recorded. So if you go to YouTube, uh, you can find recordings uh, going, uh, I think a year and a half back uh, to Paul's uh, first talk in, uh, in August, 2020. Um, so please do, it's a great, uh, resource for you or, or your students. Um, you can also follow uh, Paul's uh, Twitter uh, at source to sync uh, has updates on uh, uh, new uh, upcoming talks, uh, including the one uh, next Wednesday by Pete Raymond from Yale University, um, talking to us uh, about organic matter transport uh, and how it is controlled by, by uh, hydrology and biogeochemistry. In, uh, in watershed. So uh, please um, join us next week as well. Um, all right, so uh, today we have two speakers. Um, uh, first, uh, Andrew or Andy Wickert, who is an associate professor at the University of Minnesota, but currently uh, an Alexander von Humboldt fellow at uh, GFZ in Potsdam in, in Germany. Um, Andy got his uh, bachelor's degree uh, in, at EAPS at MIT, uh, and then later left for Colorado for the mountains to get a PhD in, in geology. Uh, and since then, he was a, a postdoc in, in Potsdam, and after that, he uh, got a tenure track position at the uh, University of Minnesota. Um, uh, Andrew uh, and Andy will be joined by uh, his PhD student, Shanti Penpreis, um, who uh, will follow up on, uh, on uh, Andy's talk. She got her bachelor's degree in geology from Carleton College uh, in the US and then uh, is now a PhD candidate with uh, Andrew in Minnesota. Um, so with that, I would like to give the floor to Andy. Andy, if you can share your screen. You're muted. Uh, yes, there you are. Ah, oh, I didn't unmute. Good. All right, there we are. I tried to press the, the hotkeys, but I think it just hit the, the other buttons. All right, here we go. And so, yeah, so this is the title slide that you've all seen. Um, and so I'm just going to scoot on past, and I have our two bios, but you already know who we are, too. And so I'm just going to bring us first straight to the group. So this is the group of students and faculty members that were out in the field with us this past season in the Whitewater Valley, which Shanti's going to be talking about next, um, you know, coming up in the second half of this. And I just I, want to put sorry, this Sorry, Andy, I still see your uh, browser. So I'm not sure if it's... Uh, we're supposed huh. to see, That's strange. see something else here. It's your, it's your slide, but it's let the me, first one. Let me try, let me do slideshow. Hmm. Oh, there's your, I, I, it right. takes a village. Can you see it now? It takes a village. Yes. Yes. Good. Great, perfect. Yes. Yes, it takes a village to make this happen. Thank you so much, Al. All right, so with that, so we have this whole, there's this whole wonderful group of folks have been helping, helping us out, working in the field together. Um, uh, Shanti's here in the black jacket. I'm over here in the University of Minnesota shirts to look nice and um, 
and unthreatening, I would say, when chatting with, with landowners. Um, the wonderful thing is that much of this is on public land, so we've had a lot of help from park services, wildlife areas, um, and going down the row here, um, so this is Neela Ishin, a PhD student, Jabari Jones, another PhD student, Campbell Dung, undergrad at Madison, Jesse Shu, undergrad at Minnesota, Harry Joel, professor at Eau Claire, we have Phil Larson, who's a professor at Mankato, and then we have Leica Welcome, who is a PhD student at Colorado School of Mines, Dan Haroth, who's a professor at Colorado School of Mines. So there's this whole group of us who've been working together to, um, to just get as much data as we can on how these river systems have been responding to the environmental change that we've been seeing over time. And I just wanted to name everybody before getting going. And so with this, um, starting out with just a roadmap about um, the Mississippi River Basin and how it's changing over time and how it has changed since its initial integration. And so sorry, and I, I still think that. it's, it's uh, oh, sorry, there it is. It just takes a, takes a while. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, hmm. Well, I didn't realize that we were, we were quite so far back. I might start hitting the forward button then early. Um, let me see if this works and this works. So you might see a flash. I, so, it's, I see your roadmap still, but it, right. that's probably what you want to show, right? Yeah, that is what I want to show. All right, so hopefully this all works. Um, so starting out here, um, I'm just going to introduce the Mississippi River. Um, and this is a picture of the Mississippi River in Iowa on the right hand side. So um, you can see the steep river bluffs and some forest islands in the middle of the river. So this is the kind of upper Mississippi River system that we're talking about. Then I'll discuss the formation and the evolution of the river. So both its long-term geological history, so since it's really in its inception, and um, the impacts of the last glacial cycle. So how glaciations have come and gone and eventually the last glacial cycle caused the bed of the river to rise and then to incise again. Um, through by modulating water and sediment supply to the river system. Following that, Shanti is going to take the Whitewater River, where the last photo was taken as an example, for how the mainstem Mississippi interacts with tributaries. And so to study the incision and aggradation there. And then following this, we're going to just look ahead to um, some, some of the future work that we have. And that looking ahead will be a bit in spoken, a bit in questions. And um, so there we go. So to start off, yeah, tell me when you see the Mississippi three rivers in one. Everyone else, it. hold tight. You see it? Okay, yes, good. Yes, yeah, it was fast this time. <laughs> good, I was about to see, see, uh, see if everyone just needed to grab some lunch, use the bathroom, make a sandwich, I don't know. Um, so the Mississippi River is kind of an agglomeration of different rivers from its geological history. And we'll be talking a lot about the Mississippi River a little bit later, but essentially we have three portions. The uppermost portion in um, the upstream of the Twin Cities in Minnesota, um, which is more or less 45 degrees north and farther north, is this post-glacial portion. That whole area developed after the ice sheets retreated and is on formerly subglacial landscapes. The Upper Mississippi is a portion of the river that, is, that crosses the Paleozoic platform of North America and is typically incised into it, and more on that to come. And the Lower Mississippi uh, occupies the Mississippi embayment, or, which itself is the physiographic expression of the real foot rift. And this is an old rift um, that dropped some, caused some major structural offsets. And in fact, at the head of the rift is the New Madrid seismic zone, which is known for the earthquake spread around St. Louis that happened you know, before the turn of the 20th century. So just to give you an idea of what these parts of the river look like, um, starting out with this post-glacial portion. So this one, you can see the forest, the gravel, the bigger boulders that possibly were derived from old glacial hills. So this is a river that essentially flows across moraines and outwash plains and just deals with the stuff that's in its way. It doesn't have a very deep valley. It doesn't have a strong topographic expression. And so, so it really is just adjusting to the post-glacial landscape. Downstream from this is the upper Mississippi. And so this is a photo I took from Frontenac State Park in Minnesota. 
looking across what's called Lake Pepin, which we'll get to in a little bit. It's, a, it's actually a naturally dammed lake on the Mississippi River. And the bits of white that you can see in the distance that aren't the clouds that are on the cliff are Dolostone Bluffs on the opposite side. And so this is pretty characteristic of this landscape with a high plateau surface, steep river bluffs, uh, indicative of some recent river incision and or valley widening. And then the river, you know, a fairly broad river between the two of them with a decent amount of alleviation in the middle. And so over here, just want to draw your eye to where my mouse is, if it's in the same time. But anyway, there's a, a, some land jutting out into the, this um, riverine lake. And that's a delta prograding out from one of the tributaries. So that's an idea of these interactions of sediment that we see in this river system. And that's part of what actually makes it such a great local place for us to run field trips and to have field research, especially in these times when going farther afield is difficult. <coughs> Pardon me. And then this is the third um, part of the river, so the lower Mississippi. <coughs> and considering the sedimentological land of the Stroud, I think this might be that's most familiar to a lot of you. And <coughs> this is this wide, big, lowland river that sits inside the Mississippi embayment. And, um, meanders across it as beautifully recorded in the Fisk maps, like the one that I have in the middle figure here. And that is also oftentimes the Mississippi River that we have in literature and of legend, you know, the, the big muddy. And this eventually empties out into the Gulf of Mexico, um, forming the Mississippi Delta complex. So we are focusing on the upper Mississippi River and I wanted to bring this in to um, a little bit of context. So first a geographic context, if you're not familiar with the United States, I, I do apologize. I'm going to try to do my best here. So the upstream end of this blue line is at the Twin Cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul in Minnesota, which is a north central state. Um, for reference, Chicago is over here, kind of in the east and middle of the map, and Canada is just north of the top of Minnesota. And the river winds its way down through these other parts of the U.S. down to a town called Cape Girardeau in Missouri, at which point it enters the Mississippi embayment. And so this is how I'm finding the Upper Mississippi River. And the source to sink connection is the fact that in the geologic past, the Mississippi has transported glacially derived water and sediment. And indeed, in the geological past, the entire source to sink routing system was changed by the ice sheets by modifying the Mississippi River drainage basin. Today, we actually continue to see these changes in water and sediment due to agriculture and climate change, which we're not really going to touch on in this talk, but you're welcome to ask us about afterwards. And so that's uh, some work that other group members have been working on um, more closely. Finally, um, you know, in the source to sink journey, right, the sediment and water delivery from the upper Mississippi then affect the lower Mississippi. Um, as a matter of fact, we can see dramatic geomorphic change in the lower Mississippi throughout the Pleistocene. Tammy Rittenauer, um, who's at Utah State, has done a lot of work dating that. And these materials then eventually might reach the Gulf of Mexico, depending on how much buffering capacity there is for these sediment loads in the lower Mississippi Valley, which is quite large. Um, and there, so there might be a coherent signal that reaches the Gulf of Mexico of these sediment inputs or it might just be really smeared out because of the capacity of the lower Mississippi to hold material temporarily. And that's something that Anjali Fernandez and I have talked about occasionally, but um, haven't really gotten to writing a grant to, to go after. So let's go back in time. This is the early Cenozoic drainage pattern of North America in slightly cartoon form, but I think in actually pretty, um, you know, not, not so far off from the best scientific knowledge we have now, and also um, a lot more accessible than most scientific paper figures. So this comes from the now defunct Earth magazine, it was penned by my friend Kat Kantner. And what we see here is, hopefully this works. Um, what, so what we see here is the, what's called the ancient Bell River system in red at the top. And the whole Bell River system is flowing 
towards Hudson Strait. And so in fact, there's a huge sediment package here. And this river system was basically, um, was just scattered because of the advance of the, um, the Pleistocene glaciers, which carved out Hudson Bay, which rerouted this part of the upstream Bell River to the Mackenzie River system here to the Northwest, and which um, rerouted parts of both the Bell River system and the Paleo St. Lawrence River to the, um, to the Mississippi down here. And so we can see that right now the Mississippi is just this short little thing occupying the Mississippi embayment with some Eastern Appalachian tributaries. And then on the Western side, we have uh, the you know, Paleo Platte River, Paleo Arkansas River, Paleo Red River. So a lot of the rivers going from the North American Cordillera into the Mississippi are still doing that. So we, we, have, we have that part. Um, however, you can see that there is no Missouri River. The, the now Missouri River, which is in this light blue, formed as an ice marginal stream. Right, think of that about does it. So that's that's how the Mississippi River started. Uh, and we also have information just kind of focusing in, in again on the sedimentary record. Um, so this is from Galloway et al. 2011, and they show where their best guess of the Paleo Divide is right over here in this green dashed line. And that's almost the exact same place that um, Jim Knox and Eric Carson and Wisconsin have placed it based on their studies of local geomorphic features. So we have the geomorphology of the upper Midwest and the sedimentology in the Gulf of Mexico um, in provenance studies lining up. And we see a much smaller Pleistocene drainage basin. And, um, and if any of you are interested in looking into this a little bit more, um, Sean Naylor at the Indiana Survey wrote a paper that I'm really fond of, and not just because I'm a co-author. Um, Sean did basically 95% of that himself. I, uh, I mostly just help with data sources and writing. And he reconstructs the, top the Pliocene topography of North America, of Central North America that was glaciated. And so you can actually have a little bit of a view, at least our best scientific guess of what this place might have looked like prior to all these drainage changes, and as you can imagine, topographic changes from erosion and deposition. It's just a little advertisement. All right, so what happened to the Mississippi um, since this time? How did the Mississippi drainage basin become enlarged? And the answer is on the right over here. So we have, oop, I gave it all away, but it's not too hard. Um, so we have a river flowing let's say northward, northeastwards, in this case, towards where the ice sheet might will eventually be coming from. And then the second figure, the ice advances. This ice advance um, then dams the river. And in the Midwest, you know, we have some topography, it's not totally flat, but we don't have, you know, kilometers of relief all over the place. And that's a little bit more the scale of what the ice was. And so the ice is high enough that it's able to dam um, uh, proglacial lakes, and then those proglacial lakes will spill over um, ancient drainage divides or interfluves, as they might also be called, and will incise them. And in so doing, will permanently re reroute the river, right? Because then when the ice goes away, the valley that the, that the meltwater spilled over and created is still there. And so here is just a, a bit of background on the geography of this drainage reversal. And so this, I just took from a 19, 2019 paper of mine, but we can see how I've reconstructed um, with some help from Sean, these rivers going to the Paleo St. Lawrence. So you can see this is in the former Wisconsin River Valley from work from Eric Carson. This river here is going back up towards Green Bay as well. And Green Bay is this little thing between the thumb of Wisconsin and the rest of it. Um, it's more than just the Packers, for those of you who are American friends. And then, and so when the ice advanced, this is a completely hypothetical ice margin, by the way. It might have been just to the east. I don't know, um, because we don't even know actually which glacial advance caused the reversal of the Mississippi. I have a couple of guesses based on some of the dating work that um, Greg Balcom and Chuck Roby have done, but um, not 100% not sure. So let's just say for the, for, to be safe, early Pleistocene, anywhere between about 2.6 and 0 0.8 million years ago, we do have constraints that it was Pleistocene from, um, from sediments 
where the westerly provenance found on the easterly side of the modern Mississippi Valley. Um, those couldn't have gotten there if the Mississippi were a through going river. And there's also some uh, timing constraints based on magnetically reversed sediments um, atop Strath terraces and in former dammed lakes. So, so we know it's sometime in there, but in any case, the early Pleistocene ice advanced, turned these former tributaries into lakes, which then overtop divides and connected these segments of the Mississippi River. And if I go over here, what you can see today is that wherever I have these small white arrows, these are sections of very narrow um, river valley, which are very good candidates, and in fact, often identified candidates for where the Mississippi River has jumped over one of these interflubes and integrated multiple parts of the river basin. And these are important because they're telling us how the ice is pushing the Mississippi River around one way or another. And, uh, and, and or in the case down south here, uh, where this is at Thebes Gap at the separation between the upper and lower Mississippi rivers, this is where the river actually filled with sediment until it was so high that it was able to flow over a bedrock low. And then um, through essentially superimposed drainage just stayed there. And just to show you this once more, we have these four different zones of exceptionally narrow river, um, other than just like kind of the part by the very upstream end, um, which naturally is narrower due to the lower water discharge. Um, we have this right here, which I've been talking about as this major integration event that I had in the last figure, but then also several other places where different ice advances have dammed parts of the Mississippi River and kind of Frankenstein them all together into one, one big through going river system. All right. So, and we also see that in the bedrock long profile of the river. So you can see these major areas of shallow bedrock. And these, again, correspond to these ancient drainage integration events. All right. So that's enough, I guess, for now about the drainage integration. So next, I'm just going to go on to tell you a little bit about some of the glacial impacts following that integration. So first off, the um, the Mississippi River has sets of extremely pronounced terraces. So on this right-hand figure, you can see here this entire flat surface in the foreground is the last glacial maximum terrace. Um, and that is from a, it's a filled terrace. So it's completely composed of sand and gravel, all glacial fluvial in origin. And what happened is that in the past when the ice sheets were present in the basin, they provide extra water, but they provide even more extra sediment. And so this through, you know, lanes balance caused the rivers to, um, to steepen. And in order to steepen, they had to deposit sediment and therefore a grade. And so here are the bedrock hills. In fact, just over here is around where I took the picture on one of those first slides. And here are the terraces. And the terraces are clearly now abandoned, right? And, and they were in size during times when the ice retreated and it retreated beyond far enough that glacial lakes formed at the margin. Those glacial lakes acted as sediment traps. And so the, the rivers received quite a lot of water, but very little sediment. And we can see here these terraces along the Mississippi that we have mapped. Um, there, these are very prevalent. And Right in the middle here, by the way, just something to look at in the background. This is the Chippewa River Delta. So this is related to another process by which the valley is currently continuing to fill in with sediment. All right, so here's just a rough chronology. This is kind of like my field sketch version, except made in Python with a spreadsheet um, input. But anyway, um, so we have um, some constraints that the Mississippi River surface was quite low before Wisconsin time. Then the ice advanced somewhere maybe likely around 30,000 years ago, entering the basin, and this caused aggradation up to the level of Savannah Terrace, which is the last glacial maximum terrace in this basin. The Savannah Terrace was then abandoned 
to another terrace level that was called the Bagley, which was then again abandoned with floods from a large proglacial lake called Lake Agassiz. And following this time of deepest incision, the Mississippi River's actually filled in since then. I'm gonna illustrate this with a few figures. So first off, we have the ice sheets directly in contact with the river providing sediment to cause the aggradation to the Savannah Terrace elevation. And following that, we have ice retreat, which is forming proglacial lakes that are hard to see, see but, but um, there's one called Glacial Lake Lind, and it's also possible, although not shown on this reconstruction, that part of Lake Superior was open water at this time as well. And so those would have been related to this first phase of episodic incision from the Savannah level down to the Bagley level. After that, glacial, but there is stabilization again of the surface. Oh, and by the way, I should say that Shanti has some unpublished dates that in fact confirm the ages that we're using here. Um, but then, uh, in, in fact, augured from a collaborator's uh, backyard, uh, in any case, where you can get the samples, right? So we have um, Lake Agassiz, which is this much better known, you know, proglacial lake, often implicated in past periods of climate change, that sends its meltwater down the Mississippi, causes very deep incision. And then the Mississippi River has filled in, and it's done so for, with a, for a combination of reasons, one of which, which we're not going to talk about as much here, but it is important, is the fact that the region is um, subsiding. It was formerly in the glacial forebulge, the peripheral bulge, and now the upper Mississippi River is actually sinking relative to some surrounding parts of the river, and therefore is acting as a, a small localized kind of sediment trap. But the bigger reason that we're going to look at right now is the fact that there's, in fact, there's enhanced sediment supply from the tributaries. And so here we are with um, base level fall um, on the tributary caused by incision of the Sun River when we have these glacial meltwater outburst floods. But those floods are actually part of the waning phase of glaciation. And eventually, the glaciers leave the catchment. And, and the main stem isn't able to continue in sizing so much. And what we instead have is the tributary taking over. It's felt this massive amount of base level fall and that tributary then starts incising into its own deposits and dumping large um, deltas of sand and gravel into the main stem Mississippi. And these eventually combine to create a braided plan form. So in fact, if you look at the Mississippi today and try to stay away from the upstream end right above some of the locks and dams where it's pooled, you'll see that it really has a braided plan, plan form and it's been degrading quite rapidly over the course of the Holocene. So about um, 20 meters or so in the upper Mississippi over the past 10,000 years. All right, so with this, we have Shanti's first slide and I'm going to stop my screen share and turn it over to her so that she's able to tell us about what happens when we start you know, propagating these effects up the tributaries and how those reconnect with the mainstem rivers. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Um, yeah, let me get to the right slide here. Um, great, can everyone see my screen? Yeah, cool. All right, yeah, so thanks, Andy, for kind of setting things up. And obviously, Andy has been, you know, focusing more on sort of the upper Mississippi um, sort of main stem system a lot in some of his work. Um, but Andy and I have also started looking at this small tributary, um, the Whitewater River, um, which is a tributary of the Mississippi River in southeastern Minnesota. So in this um, map here, you can sort of see the larger um, sort of U.S. part of North America. We have sort of the modern Mississippi River sort of superimposed over here, starting with the headwaters. Um, this sort of right here is right about with the, for those of you who are familiar with U.S. geography, this is right around sort of the border with Iowa, um, sort of southeastern Minnesota. Um, and you can see here, I've sort of superimposed um, some of these reconstructed ice margins. Um, and so the really interesting thing about the whitewater and kind of a lot of my focus with the whitewater is that, you know, it was directly connected to the Mississippi River, but at the last glacial maximum, um, it was not covered by ice. Um, so a lot of sort of the glacial forcing and the glacial signal that we're seeing um, in the whitewater is sort of directly coming from changes in base level or changes in the water level at the mouth of the Whitewater River. And so this is a really interesting sort of like very contained way of studying how, you know, as these glacial signals were propagating 
through the um, upper Mississippi River, sort of what impacts did that have on sort of this small tributary and sort of what can that tell us about sort of the impacts of changes in base level, um, just in general about tributary systems. Um, so this figure on the right here is just showing um, the sort of channel network. It's a pretty small um, little uh, basin, um, but you can kind of see um, we have the Mississippi River here. Um, these colors are just showing the changes, um, the elevation of the channel. Um, so nothing too groundbreaking here. You can see um, sort of goes from high to low elevation. Um, and the river itself has sort of these three main branches, sort of this north, middle, and south um, fork that kind of converge into a main stem um, little river that goes into the Mississippi. Um, and so, yeah, that's sort of the framing of what we're thinking about. Um, and sort of what we did and sort of what we've been thinking about in the whitewater is thinking about sort of, you know, based off of what the Mississippi was doing, how can we reconstruct um, sort of the response of the whitewater in relation to sort of this story that Andy just set up, um, thinking about how the level of the Mississippi was changing as sort of glacial sediment and water was moving through the system. So I've sort of broken this up in sort of these three different um, time periods that I've just labeled A, B, and C. Um, and I'm just gonna sort of walk through some of the work that we've been able to do to reconstruct um, what the river was sort of doing and how it was sort of responding um, to these changes in base level um, over time. So starting with this ancient period um, and sort of thinking about some of the data that we're using, um, basically Andy talked a lot about um, some of this ancient incision of the Mississippi River related to the initial integration. Um, and this was a period of very deep um, incision along the main stem Mississippi River, which as a result would have resulted in um, a major um, decrease in base level for the Whitewater River. So this map here, um, one great thing about working in Minnesota is we have a lot of really awesome data. Um, so this map here is showing in red, this is um, a trace of the valley centerline of the main stem and North Fork of the Whitewater River. And then this base map is actually showing interpolated bedrock topography, or sorry, interpolated bedrock, um, depth to bedrock. Um, and this is based off of well data and is actually created by the Minnesota Geological Survey. Um, and it's a really great thing because it allows us to see sort of what the landscape underneath a lot of the sediment that covers the, um, our modern topography today could look like. Um, and so what we're able to do um, is sort of take this interpolated bedrock depth um, and connect it to our modern valley center line. And then we can actually use that to approximate sort of the ancient bedrock profile. So we can actually see, you know, as we had the river, the main stem river dropping down, we would have had the white water incising down to meet it and it would have incised over bedrock. And since then, sort of as part of that um, plot that Andy was looking at, you know, we've had aggradation, we've had a lot of this bedrock buried. So it's not currently present at the surface but there was a time um, around this initial integration where the river was actually flowing over bedrock. And we're able to use this interpolated bedrock um, topography or depth to bedrock um, to create what we think the channel long profile um, for the river looked like potentially at this time. Um, and so this is sort of what we were able to come up with. So just to kind of orient you for those that might not be familiar with looking at channel long profiles, we have elevation here and down channel distance. So we have the headwaters of the um, Whitewater River here and then where it sort of meets the Mississippi here. And again, this is the modern valley center line um, focusing on the main stem and the North Fork. This doesn't show the whole modern system, um, but that's sort of shown here um, in black. And then in green here, we actually were able to do what I was sort of describing on that last side where we um, linked this and are able to sort of create an ancient bedrock profile using that depth to bedrock um, data. And so this is really interesting because it shows us um, what this ancient bedrock profile looks like potentially underneath the modern valley center line. Um, and so currently this is buried, but this is a really interesting thing that sort of shows, you know, we had this period of really deep incision on the main stem and we have, are on the Mississippi, and we have sort of the white water being able to come down and meet it. And this is again, how that signal is sort of propagating upstream, kind of like what Andy talked about, you know, as the white water was incising, or sorry, as the Mississippi was incising, the white water incised down to meet it and delivered all of that sediment to the Mississippi River. And again, thinking about that figure um, with the feedbacks. Um, so that's sort of a really interesting thing um, that we've begun to do with this interpolated data. Obviously that data is interpolated um, and we actually want some like real data that we can use. And so one great thing that we did when we were out there this summer, we had a big crew of us doing lots of seismic refraction lines. Um, this is all very preliminary, um, but this is again a map 
of the watershed. And you can see each of these dots are places where we completed seismic refraction lines. And this is actually going to allow us to have like hard data um, rather than this interpolated data on what this bedrock profile um, could look like. Um, this is sort of some of our preliminary results. Obviously, you can see that they're kind of all over the place. Um, but you know, we're doing some, like, con we're continuing our data processing. And then also kind of just to highlight, um, not all of our points were actually on the Valley Centerline. Um, so we had some points that we took on terraces as well. So that can also account for some of the scatter, but we're planning to do additional work um, to sort of be able to refine this data to be able to sort of connect, you know, what do we have um, along the main stem sort of valley center? What do we have from the terraces? And what also can these seismic refraction lines tell us about the 3D topography? Because, um, you know, the valley itself is not, like the bedrock valley itself is not going to be perfectly smooth or flat. There's going to be sort of these ridges and things, and that's probably what we're capturing here. But it's a really cool and interesting thing. I mean, as a geomorphologist, you know, I do a lot of stuff with sediment and sand, um, but it's been really cool to kind of tie in this seismic piece of it. Um, and I had a lot of great undergrad help um, with doing all the, we were very, we confused a lot of farmers and stuff sort of hitting the ground with the sledgehammer over and over all summer. But um, it was a really cool data set and I'm really excited to continue to refine this again, to be able to think a lot more about what sort of this ancient um, bedrock profile um, could have looked like. Um, yeah, so that's sort of the ancient period, um, but moving sort of forward in time, um, and sort of thinking again, sort of as we have the Mississippi changing, we had that period of incision, but then as Andy talked about, the Mississippi River itself um, began to aggrade during that period of ice advance, and that created the Savanna Terrace on the main stem river. So there was a period of very you know, involved um, sediment deposition on the Mississippi River, and for our little tributary of the Whitewater, that would have meant a rise in base level because you know as the bed elevation on the Mississippi is going up, we also have the Whitewater sort of responding to that. So that's sort of the second time period that we are thinking about here. Um, and basically what happened, as you know, you would probably expect, is we had a very involved period of terrace formation or sort of deposition. And then, you know, all this material was deposited um, on the whitewater that was then abandoned and formed these terraces. And so this is a map sort of, we have the Mississippi River here, we have our valley center line, and this is just a map of the mouth of the whitewater. And these are some hand mapped terraces that I went through and did. And you can see that there's a, a multitude of terrace surfaces near the mouth of the Whitewater River. And this is all material that we believe was deposited in response to this rise in base level around the last glacial maximum. The color grade here is just showing the different elevations of the terraces. You can see generally, you know, this is Minnesota topography. So we only have about 40 meters of variation. Um, but you can see that, you know, we do have sort of, at least at first glance, potentially some groupings of terraces that could have been deposited around the same time. Um, so yeah, so another thing sort of of note um, in this figure, I'm mostly showing um, terraces near the mouth of the river, um, but there are actually terraces throughout the modern watershed. Um, there are some terraces further upstream that you'll see in some of our data that are potentially a really interesting. We think they could be strap terraces. Um, this is again related um, to sort of some of the impacts of sort of changing base level, um, nick point formation, things like that on the river. Um, but there's definitely very prevalent um, in all three forks, but mostly prevalent um, right near the mouth of um, the whitewater where it meets the Mississippi. And so what we did um, to sort of get a sense of how the whitewater was responding to the Mississippi during this time period, um, we took these terraces, we again linked them to this valley center line, um, we interpolated between um, each of the terraces and we're actually, we're able to potentially make some first order estimations of what we think the river profile may have looked like when those terrace surfaces were active. Um, so this is again, sort of similar setup to our last figure we were looking at. We have the modern valley center line here. This is where the headwaters are. This is where it meets the Mississippi. And each of these blue dots is one of those map terraces I showed um, on that last slide. And so you can see here that they're all above the modern valley center line, as you would expect, because they're sort of abandoned floodplains. Um, and as if we do some sort of first order grouping of these um, sort of terraces that we're seeing, we can kind of distinguish sort of two trends or two sort of elevations that seem the most sort of prominent. Um, and so this sort of top one that we're seeing here, we believe could be linked to this sort of savanna level of aggradation on the Mississippi. So as the Mississippi was brought up, the white waters base level was brought up that created this high level of deposition that we believe um, was sort of where these terraces are today. 
Um, and then this sort of lower level that we're seeing is actually what we're believing, we believe is linked to the Bagley level on the Mississippi River. Um, and so this was, you know, we had this savanna level, there was a period of incision right around 17 and a half thousand years ago. Um, and then that sort of formed this floodplain that's the Bagley level that was then abandoned um, with the big Lake Agassiz floods. Um, and we believe that we're seeing that here. And then of course you're saying, well, there's a lot of different points that aren't necessarily accounted for um, in sort of this preliminary um, estimation that we've done. Um, and so one thing that we think is going on here, sort of the main stem, um, a lot of the tributaries that we initially mapped um, kind of go up these tributaries as well. So a lot of these terraces aren't necessarily directly formed by the main stem. So kind of along here, we believe these are actually tributary terraces or terraces that are sort of, again, thinking about this propagation upstream. So tributaries of the white water would have also formed terraces. So that's what we believe are sort of these higher surfaces. And again, I mentioned those strat terraces. We think that that's kind of what's going on up here. Um, we're actually planning on doing some more field work um, this summer. And I think a lot of the stuff we'll be doing will probably be sleuthing out, um, seeing kind of what these terraces could be up here, but we think that that's kind of related um, to sort of this overall um, shape of the channel long profile of the modern Mississippi, which will also, or of the modern whitewater, which we'll also talk about um, in a little bit. Um, but this is a really kind of cool, um, interesting, like first guess at what we see um, the whitewater is doing um, in response to changes in the Mississippi. Obviously, this is just sort of first order estimation and sort of our best guess based off of what we know the Mississippi was doing. But as Andy mentioned, I spent a lot of time in the lab this fall um, and we're actually waiting on some dates to confirm um, the exact age of sediments taken from these two terrace levels. Um, but we feel fairly confident in saying that this is sort of the response of the Whitewater River um, to the Savannah and Bagley level formations on the modern Mississippi or on, yeah, on the Mississippi River. Um, and so then finally, um, the last period um, that I'm gonna talk about is sort of the modern river. So we had, you know, this period of, you know, aggradation, incision down to the Bagley level, deeper incision, and then aggradation since then. And then we have sort of what the modern river looks like today. And this again, sort of touches on some of the stuff Andy was talking about with how, you know, the modern, you know, upper Midwest, Minnesota, large parts of it are still sort of seeing the impacts um, of, you know, these glacial signal and seeing a lot of, and a lot of the landforms are still sort of preserving a lot of the impacts of the Laurentide ice sheet, the water and sediment that was delivered to them. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of things that we can actually still see in the landscape today um, as a result of that. Um, and so basically the main thing that we're sort of seeing um, is basically the impacts of two very different reaches on the Whitewater River. And we think these two different reaches really show a lot of the impacts of the Mississippi River. So I've talked a lot about you know, this downstream end sort of near the Mississippi River. It's a very broad alluviated valley, lots of sediment, lots of sort of big, um, the river itself sort of moves through a very big valley. Um, but if we move upstream on the modern Whitewater River, the river itself is actually quite narrow um, comparatively, um, and it flows almost directly on a limestone sort of carbonate bedrock. Um, and so this is really interesting because it sort of shows, you know, how the river's characteristics have changed because near the mouth, it's been more directly receiving that signal from the Mississippi River. Um, and that's allowed for a lot of the sediment deposition, a lot of the incision, aggradation near the mouth, whereas upstream that signal hasn't necessarily propagated as much. Um, and so that's one of the kind of interesting things about this river because we kind of had this really interesting transition from sort of a bedrock um, to an alluvial um, system. Um, and so that's kind of what we see today. This is now the modern um, Whitewater Rivers channel long profile. So we were sort of focusing on just sort of this section here um, and sort of the other data sets I was showing, but now this shows sort of all the way upstream, focusing on all three branches. Um, and so this is again, sort of upstream to downstream with elevation, but what we've superimposed with over this is now the depth to bedrock. And this is really highlighting what I was just talking about um, was sort of the transition from bedrock to sort of alluviated. Um, so we have up here sort of these more purple colors where the bedrock is very close to the surface. And so this is again, sort of up here and down into this nick zone that we have sort of preserved in the modern river. Whereas downstream, we have very deep depths of bedrock. So you can see this downstream end is pretty much all covered um, in sediment. And so it's really interesting. And then of course, um, we have this big nick zone that I keep sort of showing us. Um, and this is, you know, you would expect a river to have 
sort of a nice concave profile. And the fact that we have this nick zone preserved in the modern river means that, you know, that is again the impacts of base level as sort of the white water was responding to the Mississippi, it would have sort of incised down and formed this nick zone. Um, so yeah, again, showing just connecting to what the actual watershed looks like today, we have sort of this big broad sediment covered valley in this section of the river down here, and then a more narrow, more bedrock dominated valley as we move upstream. Um, and so what's actually really interesting um, that you know, Andy and I were able to put together is this modern Whitewater River actually shows two different concavities um, for this sort of upstream and downstream um, reach which is you know, not something you would necessarily expect for a system that is continuous. Um, and we think that this is again, sort of the impacts of this changing base level on the river that is still preserved in the modern river system. So this upstream river here, or this upstream stretch here has a concavity of about 0.54. Um, but then downstream is actually 1.47. And so what we're thinking could have potentially been the main driver of this was sort of as we had um, sort of kind of going back to um, sort of this period of reaggradation where we have sort of filling back in, we had sort of the river sort of flowing down and then flowing down into the Mississippi as the Mississippi sort of reaggraded, it would have brought um, the level of the whitewater back up and sort of allowed for a lot of the sediment deposition, but could have also increased the concavity as it sort of pulled um, the river back up. And so this is really interesting because even in the modern system, even in the modern whitewater river, we're still seeing the impacts of um, you know, the changing base level that was driven by glaciation. Um, and this is just a tributary river, and this is just one of many tributary rivers. So even though the main stem, Mississippi, was the one that was directly receiving this water and sediment, you know, the entire system was affected, you know, throughout time, you know, going back to this ancient time period, but even up until the present, um, still is feeling the impacts of this sort of glacial signal um, along the main stem, Mississippi. Um, and so kind of piecing together um, all of what I've just talked about here um, and sort of thinking about sort of the changes in this whitewater system over time. We have this ancient period where the Mississippi River was deeply incised. This caused incision along the whitewater tributary system, um, which sort of flowed over this ancient bedrock profile that is now buried. Um, then there was a period of aggradation during that period of ice advance that caused the river to aggrade upwards to form um, this sort of ter highest terrace level that we're seeing here. Um, then there was sort of that period of aggradation or incision down to the Bagley level. Um, then there was a period of deeper incision um, that has sort of come back up um, to where the present <clears throat> river is today. Um, so this is just a really cool sort of what we've been working on in the whitewater. There's also lots of other cool stuff that we're doing there, but it's really cool because we sort of have these snapshots through time. Um, you know, Andy told this sort of long million year story of um, what the Mississippi was doing. And now we sort of have these snapshots of how, you know, its tributaries could have, you know, responded to a lot of these changes that we saw um, on the Mississippi River. Um, so kind of to wrap things up um, and sort of summarize a lot of what Andy and I have talked about today, um, Andy sort of touched a lot on the sort of glacially mediated integration of the Mississippi, how sort of the Mississippi drainage network as we sort of know it today um, formed. Um, he also talked a lot about sort of the interactions with water and sediment supply, um, with sort of setting terrace and bed elevation, thinking about sort of, again, this story here where we have periods of incision and aggradation directly linked to changes um, in signals from the ice front. Um, and then, you know, this propagates through this entire network. It impacted the mainstem Mississippi, but as I just sort of talked about with the Whitewater River, that also had impacts on all of the tributary systems that were connected um, to this mainstem Mississippi. Um, and then, you know, we can see that um, preserved in sort of the modern um, landscape. And we're actually able to use a lot of really cool different methods, a lot of really interesting data sets um, to sort of begin to get a snapshot of what these sort of responses of not only the Mississippi, but these tributaries were um, to these changes um, in sort of glacial signaling over time. Um, and I believe that is our last slide. So I'm happy to take questions. Andy, feel free to touch on things if you want to, but um, yeah, hopefully this was interesting and I'm happy to yeah, answer any questions you may have about this. Great, thank you very much, uh, Chanti and, and Andy. This is wonderful. I, I really like the, your, your take on this source to sink seminar series where you have deltas and rivers and, and valley fills and terraces uh, showing that uh, showing a lot of the complexities of, of sources and sinks within uh, within river basins. I, I, uh, I 
if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to unmute yourself uh, and answer or, or type your question in the chat. Um, and perhaps while, uh, while people are gathering their thoughts, I, I, have, a, I have a question um, for chat. You, you've, been, you've done a, a lot of dating. You said, is there mostly the terraces? I was wondering if you could also date the incision because it, it seems like you have two periods of high incision, the, the oldest one, the pre-Wisconsin, and also a deeper incision around LGM, um, or a little after LGM, around 10 Ka. So uh, how can you? How do you know if the if the baseline you show here, the green line, which one of those it is? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the dating that I've been working on has been mostly focused on the LGM time period. Um, just because I'm working mostly with OSL and um, Pimberlium. So that's a little bit more on the LGM time period. But yeah, I mean, I think that that green sort of ancient profile is a really interesting one. I think a lot of the work that we're doing um, with the seismic refraction will give us a sense of sort of the sediment thickness, um, which we can kind of get a sense of, you know, how sort of the deposition rate. Um, but yeah, that's a really interesting question. I mean, some of the work I'm doing with the cosmogenics um, is related to um, sort of thinking about erosion and deposition rates. Um, so that can kind of give us some sense of that. Um, we're sort of planning to do some paired OSL 10 beryllium um, that can kind of give us a sense, you know, not only are we depositing, but we're also incising. And so that'll give us a sense of some of that stability of these surfaces and things like that. Um, but yeah, I think that's, you know, a lot of this work is preliminary and some of like, this is sort of our first field season out there. Um, so we're definitely thinking a lot about how we can expand um, our understanding and sort of think about how we can piece all this together with more concrete um, numbers and dates. So, yeah. Shanti, if you don't mind me stepping in, I can, I can offer a bit more from actual past literature too. Um, so, so one thing is, and, and there's actually one of the things about working in the Midwest is that there's so much unpublished um, data lying around. And so some published and unpublished work by Jim Knox, who's a longtime geomorphologist at UW-Madison, uh, includes um, sam radiocarbon samples that are from deep in the alluvial fill. And so there, we have that. And then we also have some work from Dylan Blumentritt, who is a professor at Winona State in southeastern Minnesota, really close to the white water, in fact, who is coring Lake Pepin, this, you know, river, you know, this riverine delta dammed lake um, in the middle of the Mississippi. Um, and, and so both of those actually have um, materials that, that constrain the timing of the aggradation by punching through the alluvial fill. And, and so, yeah, and both, uh, all of the, that material is sort of like um, earliest Holocene, latest Pleistocene. So that's right around where I have that in the figure. So that, that's where we have that information. Um, what we really don't have is information on the exact timing of the pre-Wisconsin incision and integration, right? And so, I, and so some questions I've asked is, was, um, so my personal thought is that it was likely one major incisional event um, because following that um, drainage re rerouting and incision, the rivers would then, um, instead of having a proglacial lake going to them, more often be directly connected to the ice front and therefore likely filled with sediment. And, um, and some of the data that we have also suggests the, um, the presence of an inner gorge um, because when we look at, you know, drillings and depth of bedrock data, we have most data kind of sitting at one level and then a few, but like substantial enough, a half dozen or so, or maybe 10 points that are all down about, you know, 20 plus meters below that. And so that's what I think has happened is that we have, we'll, we'll likely have some sort of deeper bedrock inner gorge, at least in the main stem Mississippi, possibly in its tributaries, and then have a broader bedrock surface that was more often occupied um, for, for a longer period of time. But when that initial incision integration happened, um, yeah, unfortunately, with our best constraints now are sometime after the start of the Pleistocene and prior to the um, Bruins Maniyama transition, so um, 800,000 years ago or so. Cool. Thank you. Hey, um, Andy and uh, Santi, a uh, great, great talk. So I uh, learned a lot, particularly the you know Upper Mississippi River Valley. So um, I like uh, particularly you know your historical. Uh, chart, you know, showing here, 
um, particularly the role of the Agassiz flood that contribute sharply cut down of the riverbed. So that's very, very interesting. Is, uh, is this uh, uh, is also leading to the younger dries or before the younger dries? Kind of? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Shanti, I'll, I'll go for this quick and then please just um, stop me or jump in. I, I, and, and, and also, so after that, during the Holocene, all the way to now, and do we see any other climate related driving mechanism or driving force to impact, affect the riverbed change? Or particularly last couple hundred years, is the human activity have any impact? Any signal we can see? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Paul. Those are, those are great questions. Um, I'm going to back up and kind of give one big picture thing, and then I think jump into all three of what you th the things that you've asked. I think that's something that Yap was also touching on about the source to sink question, is that here we have all of this storage in, um, in terraces, right? Then it gets flushed out. And, and there's a question um, that actually a lot of my colleagues, including Taylor Children, Steffi Tefeld at Potsdam are trying to answer, which is what happens when we think about these temporary sediment storage reservoirs that really aren't preserved in the long-term stratigraphic record. And so if you look at something like the Mississippi Delta and the Gulf of Mexico, how much, how much is this actually affecting the signal by having temporary storage released in the valleys? And therefore, how much of the, how is that climate signature getting from the, well, let's just say the atmospheric system to the land surface system to the marine depositional system. So that, that's something I'd, I'd forgotten to mention in my section of the talk, but I'm, I'm interested in, in the context of the seminar. To go more directly at um, Paul's questions. So these Agassiz floods are the southward directed ones at 13.4 thousand years ago. There are radiocarbon dates um, in the spillway and Shanti actually just uh, got two OSL dates back uh, last year, or, or a little bit over a year ago in fact, that show that just hit that same time exactly. So we know when that happened and that that didn't size the vaguely. Um, and our dates in the deepest incision are, as I mentioned, earliest Holocene. I also, we don't show this here, but from oxygen ice step records, we can put together a paleohydrograph on the Mississippi River going pretty continuously back to 24,000 years or so and discontinuously back to about 46. We don't, we, we see a blip in the early Holocene, which is likely associated with ice re-advanced to Lake Superior. But otherwise we, we see just sort of like up, up and down variability, no real consistent change in the river discharge. So I think that, um, I think that if there are climate signals, um, that those might be, um, I, I wonder if the Mississippi is just such a big river valley that is integrating over the, the, ver the internal climatic variability of the Holocene. Two, two pieces that we, one piece that we do know um, from Jim Knox's work is that during the middle Holocene, we see um, abandoned meanders that are now buried um, increase their dimensions. And so we probably had larger bank full flood events right during the mid-Holocene, which would be associated with global warming and, um, and likely larger rain events, warmer atmosphere, more moisture carrying capacity. The last thing to Paul's question, um, over the last 200 years, we see dramatic changes through this whole system. Rivers and tributary streams to this are increasing in width by anywhere between like 10 and 70 or 80%. Um, the rate of deposition in Lake Pepin, which is upstream of the delta that I showed you, the Chippewa River Delta, has increased tenfold. And some of this relates to the greater hydrological activity sweeping material away. Some of this relates to uh, major human land use change, mostly associated with agriculture. So, yeah, we, we, have, we have probably done, you know, yeah, we've, we have changed rates potentially comparably to what like a glaciation would. Yeah, and that's something that Andy and I are going to be looking into with that combined OSL beryllium stuff we were talking about, sort of looking at some of these sort of longer time scale erosion rates and comparing that to the erosion rate seen sort of post settlement once agriculture really moved into the valley. Cool. It will be super cool in the future if you can pick up a couple uh, little bit downstream side and then do a comparison, you know. Uh, upstream river bed, how about the downstream sink part is, you know, <laughs> to the correlation. <laughs> Paul has always tried to move everyone towards deltas. 
All right. I, I see it's four o'clock. So uh, thank you again very much, Andy and Shanti. I, I really, really enjoyed your talk and uh, thinking about sources sink a little higher up. Um, so thanks again. And uh, for everyone else uh, and for Shanti and, and Andy, of course, as well. See you. Uh, see you next week. Thank you.